did want to start the program. Hafade, Mount Sac Tatal Mano, Naansi Fafanagwe, Andy Farron Sims. Hello, Mount Sac community. My name is Dr. Andy Farron Sims, and I have the distinct privilege of serving for a few more days as your director of student life and advisor to associated students. I would like to thank associated students for sponsoring today's ceremony and luncheon. Um, it is a very special recognition to honor inspiring women of Mount San Antonio College. It is now my pleasure to introduce our associated students president, Ms. Danny Silva. Hello. At this time, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge and reflect, express our sincere gratitude and appreciation of the peoples, ancestors, and sacred land that we gather upon today. We want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous people who have been here since time immemorial, and to recognize that we must continue to build solidarity, kinship, and love with Native American and indigenous communities. Mount San Antonio College is based in the city of Walnut in the Los Angeles Basin. We honor the Kitch Nation, the Hashiman Nation, and the Tongwa tribe, as well as the village of Pimokunga. We would also like to pay our respects to the land and life of indigenous people, the Honuvectum ancestors, the Ahihiram elders, and our Hiyuhenkum, relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. As all of our liberations are tied together, and so is our history, we also acknowledge that this country was built up from the free enslaved labor of black people and we honor the legacy of the African diaspora. We pay respects to black life, knowledge, and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. With this land, life, and labor acknowledgement, we also recognize a duty to give honor through our work and continue to stand up for racial and social justice every day. Please join us in a moment of silence and a collective breath. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. So at this time, yes. We will, we will return to lunch, so please enjoy the amazing lunch. Thank you, Sodexo, and the team that has provided it. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. And after lunch, we will begin our formal program.
attention, please. It's so nice to see everyone enjoying their lunch. Um, we planned this for several months, and it's, it's so nice to see. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie Hennings. I am the Administrative Specialist for Associated Students, and I also serve as the Chair of the Inspiring Women Committee. This year is our 20th annual celebration. Um, for those that don't know, this event was actually started by two AS officers about 20 years ago, and it's, it's grown every year, so it's very exciting. We are honoring our phenomenal women of Mount Sac, who are the national theme of women who advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. To begin this special celebration and officially welcome our recipients, guests, and community, it is now my honor to introduce one such phenomenal woman who already exemplifies this year's theme, President Martha Garcia. Thank you so much. It is truly a pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm honored and humbled to serve as your president. I have the privilege every day to come to campus, every day that I'm here, and truly see the amazing women that not only work here, but also the students that come here and are making a difference collectively. So really, really grateful to be amongst you as we share this space and we recognize amazing exemplar women of Mount Sac. Today we have the opportunity to celebrate them, honor them. They inspire us and are making a difference every day. But all of you are. I'm especially excited to see a young lady here who I had the opportunity to meet. And as we create these spaces and model behavior, especially for our future leaders, professionals, it is amazing that she's here with us today. The future is in your hands. To all female employees and students, I applaud you for your tenacity, for your strength, for your love, for your care, and your wisdom. I would like to thank Leslie and the Inspiring Women Planning Committee for organizing this beautiful event. Everything is beautiful, the arrangements that are set uh, on the tables, the space itself was dec decorated in a way that truly resembles the importance of acknowledging and honoring amazing females. I would like to introduce the distinguished members of the Board of Trustees who are amongst us celebrating these remarkable women. Trustee Jay Chen and his beautiful wife Karen are here with us. and student trustee, Cesar Tlatuani Alvarado. <laughs> to the women who are being honored today, Nikel Bass, Janice Charles, Dr. Julie Marquez, Dr. Lori Walker, all of you are advocates for equity, diversity, and inclusion and you demonstrate that with your actions and your aspirations, especially our students. You're making a difference. And this is not the start of your journey, so I imagine where you will continue and uh, achieve and contribute in many ways that you may at this point have not realized, but you already demonstrate that you can and you will. Women's History Month, is a time to praise the countless contributions and achievements of women throughout history, honoring their resilience, strength, and determination. The first females I think about every day, 
but especially as I think about honoring women are my mother, Marta Garcia, and my grandmother, Nana Elena. They both taught me resilience, strength, shared their wisdom, taught me how to be a survivor, taught me how to stand up when I would fall and continue to move forward. They loved me unconditionally. And then they, they demonstrated courage and values that continue to lead who I am and what I do and how I show up in spaces now. So I honor them, may they both rest in peace and I thank them for their contributions. We stand on the shoulders of many great women and this month provides an opportunity to highlight diverse experiences and voices of women from all walks of life, including women of color, women from our LGBTQIA plus community, women with disabilities, indigenous women, women whose stories have not always been shared in the way that they deserve to be shared, in the way that we should be honoring them. Throughout history, inspiring women have dedicated their lives to advocating for diversity, equity, and inclusion, breaking barriers, breaking glass ceilings, and paving the way for future generations. We recognize pioneers, there are many, and I'm going to mention a few, and I know I'm leaving many out. Some like the amazing, remarkable Rosa Parks, Audre Lorde, modern day activists such as Malala Yousaf Sai, Tarana Burke, and our first female president of this college, President Marie T. Mills. She served this college from 1969 to 1972. I stand here on her shoulders. And I acknowledge that. But I also acknowledge the men in the room and acknowledge all of you that support us women as we continue to do this work. We do it collectively. And I'm really grateful for your support here today and every day. Remarkable women remind us of the power of diversity, equity, inclusion and creating a more just and compassionate world. And they inspire us to continue their legacy of activism and advocacy. To those being acknowledged today, it is my honor to congratulate you. Muchisimas felicidades. To all women, con continue changing the world, spreading love, kindness, and inspiring others. Every day we have the opportunity to inspire our students and inspire our community because we resemble hope for everyone. So I thank you and I wish you an amazing event as we continue to celebrate each other and share a very special space together. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Garcia, for welcoming our campus community of today's, to today's celebration. At this time, I would also like to thank and recognize the following college leaders in attendance with us today. Please hold your applause until all names have been shared. Campus leaders, will you please stand to be recognized when I call your name? President Martha Garcia, Trustee Jay Chen, Student Trustee Cesar Alvarado, Vice President of Administrative Services, Morris Rodriguez, Associate Vice President of Student Services, Tom Mauck. Dean of Student Services, Dr. Koji Wasugi. Dean of Access and Wellness, Dr. Connie Gutierrez. 
Associate Dean Student Success and Equity, Dr. Eric Lara. Associate Dean Counseling, Lena Soto. Associate Dean of Student Engagement, Tanya Robles. Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, Dr. Carolyn Hoover. Dean of Natural Sciences, Dr. Denise Bailey. Academic Senate President, Tanya Enders. And any faculty in attendance, please stand. And also managers, in attend and if you're in attendance, please stand. And also any AS officers, if you're here, please stand. Wonderful, thank you. You may be seated. I would also like to recognize our Inspiring Women Planning Team and nomination readers for whom without their coordination, this event would not be possible. Please hold your applause until all names have been shared. Julia Walker, Gab Gabby Kiros, Xiaopan Shui, Lupe Acosta, Ethan Wang, Echo Hang, Logan Wells, Manal Khan, and Tosh Bue. Thank you. It is now my honor to invite back to the stage Ms. Danny Silva, Associated Students President, to introduce this year's keynote speaker. It's me again. <laughs> Before I get into this I'm most anticipated part of, of of my part of this. I want to um, also acknowledge someone who I feel slightly personally responsible. <laughs> I sat on their hiring committee. So um, Dr. Melva Castro is our VP of Student Services. And I just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge her as well as she is in attendance. Can we get a round of applause? Where is she? I know she's around here somewhere. There she is. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was amazing having um, the opportunity to make sure that the person who took Dr. Audrey's position was someone of the caliber of Dr. Castro, someone who puts students first and who understands how special it is to represent student services here at Mount San Antonio College. So I just wanted to thank you for continuing to, to do that. I know it's, it's hard shoes to fill and you are, you're doing an impeccable job. So thank you so much. And now, our keynote speaker is a first generation college student. Born to immigrant Filipino parents. She was born and raised on Guam, where she graduated high school. She's a Mount Sac alumna, class of 92, <laughs> who also competed for one season on the track and field team. If y'all know about our track and field team, you know that that means she's a boss. <laughs> before transferring to Cal Poly Pomona. There she earned her Bachelor's of Science in Urban and Regional Planning with a minor in Quantitative Research. She also earned a Master's of Science degree in Counseling, Student Development, and Higher Education. She earned her Doctorate in Educational Leadership from CSU Fullerton. Her dissertation, Voices from the Pacific, Narratives of Pacific Islander Students Attending a California Community College earned her CUF's 2020 Outstanding Scholarly and Creative Activity Award. She has been engaged with Asian Pacific Americans in higher education, what we belovedly call APAHI, as part of the planning committee for the Anapizi pre-conference session since 2011 and is a member of APAHI 2024 Conference Planning Committee. She has also served as the NASPA Western Regional Conference Community College Institute Chair and was appointed to the Anapizi Steering Committee for APIA Scholars in 2022, a national organization which is focused on research and advocacy. She has presented at local, regional, national, and international 
higher education conference spaces on topics relevant to Anna PC and the AANHPI students. She has also co-authored two peer-reviewed journals, An Ethic of Care, Humanizing Relationships and Asserting Cultural Values at an Anna PZ AAPI Nexus in 2022, and The Role of Asian American and Native American Pacific Islanders Serving Institutions in Reframing Leadership Education in 2021. In her personal time, she enjoys cruising, traveling, and spending time with her closest friends. To some of her students, she is mama. And to others, she is auntie. She understands the significance this holds with the AANHPI community as an ontological perspective. Cultural values such as inafa maulik, which refers to reciprocity and striving for harmony, and Magpamala Sakit, referring to care, serve as her moral compass. These cultural values provide context for relationships, which imposes a level of responsibility on institutional agents to empower and transform the student experience in ways that demonstrate an ethic of care for the village that we are on. The concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion are connected to her cultural lens, one that strives to care for those most vulnerable within the community. She believes that advocating for diversity and inclusion is a shared practice, manifested in all the ways that we show up for each other, like you are today. As a testament to fulfilling our obligation to protect human dignity and to help transform lives, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ada Quenzis Uvas, Director of the Arise Program, the Anapizi Grant, and the AANHPI Student Achievement Program. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Danny. Magandang hapon and hafa day. I am from a family of immigrants. I am from my Kuya Mario, who left my family too soon, forcing me into a period of wrestling with mortality, suffering, forgiveness, and finding resilience when I was barely eight. I am from my father, who labored as a construction worker, a taxi driver, a barber, and a great storyteller for as long as I can remember, even while enduring dialysis in the last one and a half years of his life. I am from my mother, my first editor, who checked grammar and spelling in my writings despite a limited education, and with whom I journeyed alongside to the darkest corners of dementia as her health diminished over time. When I reflect on this year's theme, women advocating for equity, diversity, and inclusion, my heart felt an impulse to reframe it as women advocating for human dignity. The nature of our work is ultimately bound to the protection of human dignity and capacity building. The responsibility we have as educators is to activate human potential by co-constructing a pathway for each student to meet their educational goals, while facilitating mechanisms to, meet, to disrupt social inequities, which often reflect the pervasive and generational experiences of black, indigenous, people of color communities, living below the poverty line, unemployment, gender inequity and pay, 
limited access to health and educational resources, unstable housing, or unfair working conditions. And when we also take into consideration how these social conditions impact our undocumented, formerly incarcerated, system impacted, former foster youth, deaf and hard of hearing access, and LGBTQIA communities, we are reminded of the intersectionality of multi-layered identities and complex situations. Students may have to make a bold choice to pursue college, despite the barriers that they confront. Our system of higher education continues to be tested in its ability to center human dignity as its moral compass. The context of time and place is unique to each of us and how our worldviews are informed. Connected to where one was raised, familial migration and immigration stories, and the socio-historical political forces during one's lifespan. In the Tongan language, tau hi va is a concept that denotes the way in which we care for the social spatial relations in which we occupy. It is the consciousness of how we treat others, how we demonstrate other Tongan concepts like ofa, faka apa apa, reciprocity, fetikone aki love, reciprocity, and responsibility. In Tagalog, we use the term magpamalasakit, which is an assertion of care, or with Nell Noddings, a contemporary philosopher, refers to as ethic of care. In Chamorro culture, inafamalic refers to the way in which we strive for harmony, restore peace, or make good or right. My advocacy is rooted in these cultural anchors and serves as my moral compass. In my childhood, I was surrounded by a village of elders, my own set of aunties and uncles, who advocated for me to pursue higher education. I ventured to get off the rock, flew across the vast Pacific Ocean over 6,000 miles, and set, and set foot on this very campus. I remember standing at 26B Quad, we all know where that is, right, thinking, I am not college material. It was a negative self-perception I had, unsure of how it became such an insidious belief. In the ARISE program's first falafona, which is Samoan for house meeting, we gathered a room full of Pacific Islander students. I will never forget the harrowing sentiments that somewhat mirrored my own negative self-talk. One student stated, "Polys are not expected to succeed which was followed by another student's remark. People expect that we are only good in sports and that we aren't good, smart enough for school. People expect us to fail and not expect us to be anything in life. But we do have what it takes to be something or someone in life. I believe that these sentiments reflect that of many of our marginalized students. I advocate for human dignity because these disparaging remarks, these reflections, are ones that we, as a community, are empowered to disrupt, reframe, and uplift. How do we pull away, how do we pull our students away from the margins? Relationships and representation matters. In the way that we create a sense of belonging, sorry, in the way that we create a sense of belonging, provide culturally affirming and healing spaces, design inclusive curriculum, and cultivate student development opportunities for adulting and leadership. In our village, we must weave our stories for advocacy, not only as a theme for accreditation, but as an ongoing community of practice. As I look out to all of you, I am inspired by all the women here today and out there in a streamland <laughs> who have empowered me through their own advocacy and the leadership from all corners of this campus. Collectively, we witness students' discoveries in the building of their confidence and their self-efficacy, in the way they roam confi in the, sorry, in the way they roam campus more confidently, in the learning that occurs in and outside the classroom, all of which reinforces that college is a worthwhile investment for a future they can envision. Let us continue to uplift each student and each other. 
one interaction at a time. Mi hermana, Dr. Annabel Perez, gifted me this artwork. They say I dream too big. I say they think too small. Women should know no bounds. And finally, thanks to my dad, who you see up here for uplifting me, and to all the girl dads out there who will do the same for the next generation of women. Thank you. Chetlu, Magahaga, Fafanagwe, Aida. Let me translate that for you all. Sister, wisdom leader, Dr. Aida, thank you so much. Leslie is going to be presenting you with a gift. Leslie, if you could please join us. And I want to just ask everyone here today just to thank Dr. Aida Quinza Uvas one more time for honoring us with her wisdom and her leadership here today. Right. So next, there might be more gifts coming for her a little bit later. For our recipients, know that I am vertically challenged, so the microphone is down. Please feel free to elevate it as needed, okay? But we will now start the portion of the recognition of our inspiring women of Mount Sat 2024, okay? So, Please welcome Alpin Gibbons, who will present this honor to our first recipient. It is humbling to be up here after those words from Dr. Ida. Thank you. And I have the privilege, the honor, to present Nikel as definitely someone who represents the work that we see up here on the screen. I've known her for four or five years now here on campus and I've just seen her grow and blossom, thrive and flourish. And I'm inspired every day, Nikel, when I think about you and everything that you've done here on campus. It's been a blessing, a pleasure, a treasure to work with you. And I'll just leave you all with this. Nikel doesn't like it when I say this, but Nikel best, Nikel is the best. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Gonna grab my speech real quick. All right. Hello, everyone. Wow, I'm really honored to be here. I wanted to say a warm welcome to my family, to Mount Sac students, faculty, alumni, friends, and the community. First of all, I would love to say thank you for coming and showing your support for all of us as we celebrate the Inspiring Women Award. I'm extremely grateful and honored to receive this award as an inspiring woman in 2024. I do feel that I have, I'm confident that I am deserving of it because I am one of the hardworking individuals who provide services and to make sure that our deaf community feels inclusive. Really the goal is equity here on campus.
So the Mount Sac Inspiring Women of 2024's theme this year is women who advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion. I see that this year's theme aligns with who I am. I think it's crucial to recognize that a lot of women, including myself, have daily struggles in eliminating disruptions caused by prejudice as well as discrimination. I think that it is important to empower ourselves by speaking up and making our experience and, vo and voices heard. It is also important that our values are heard as well. This can help create a better world that allows for effective transformation. Looking back, I remember being overwhelmed on my first day of campus. I had never experienced a mainstream school before. I used to go to the Riverside School for the Deaf, which was 100% accessible in sign language, which was amazing. It helped us to achieve our goals. And so this was my first experience not having those resources. And I did find there were a lot of barriers here. And so instead of giving up, I worked really hard to make sure that there was equity here. So it's important for change to happen now, not to wait for it to happen later in life. So I would like to share three things that I have accomplished here. Honestly, I feel like I could go on, but I, I'm gonna stick with the three today. <laughs> three things that I felt that I did that were impactful. So I wanted to make sure that people were not feeling oppressed here on campus, that people felt included. And so that was definitely my goal for the deaf community here on campus. I wanted educators and people here to understand what it was like and to make sure that they were being inclusive. One example was there was a video project that I worked on in regards to the land acknowledgement that I did in ASL. And I was able to share that with the faculty. Because often there, there are people who do the land acknowledgement in English, but there's nothing signed for the deaf community to have visual accessibility to. And so it was something that I took the time to do and there was finally a moment where it was used in the classroom, it was used during our graduation ceremony. And so that was something that I felt gave equity for deaf individuals here on campus. I also worked with our access program here, trying to help out professors and staff members to make sure that things were accessible in sign language on campus. I thought it was important to educate the faculty and the community here, and just to show how important and impactful it is for students that are incoming or current students to make sure that they felt that they knew what was happening around campus, that they felt equal to their peers that could hear. I did have some faculty come and thank me about the things that I had implemented and how it had changed their perspective on what deaf students experience in the classroom and out in the world as well. They were able to better change their curriculum to match the deaf students. And my final one is I have been involved with the Academic Senate here on campus and several clubs. Uh, I'm a, I also work over in Student Services and the SSSC and I am a senator here as well. So I've been here for three years and there are things that I have noticed that we needed in terms of accessibility for students and definitely changes on campus to make 
the campus more accessible for deaf students, such as captioning, uh, video accessibility. And so that was just another accomplishment that I have. I also wanted to make sure that there was an acknowledgement that, you know, it's not just deaf students, it's not just hearing students, we're in it together, but I want everybody to understand each other's perspectives. And so I did learn a lot from the hearing community on how to bridge that gap with the deaf community. And so, I really would like to say thank you to Mount SAC. We have such an amazing program here over at the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Center. They provide so many accommodations. We have interpreters, captioners, you name it. It is an amazing resource to have here on campus. And especially the front desk workers. They are deaf students and they are incredible. Most importantly, I would like to recognize somebody that inspired me the most here, uh, Leanne, Leanne Osborne. She's a black deaf woman and she has really taught me, she's the first black deaf woman that I've seen as a director. And I really admire and respect her leadership, her wisdom, I just, I really, really massively respect Dr. Leanne Osborne and her contributions to the community. I mean, it's not easy for a black deaf woman to go through all of the barriers and inequalities that she's had to face. I value and respect her leadership for teaching me things over the past year, and I have seen a significant increase in my knowledge and my ability to lead and to speak out for myself as a black, deaf, queer woman. It has taught me how to speak out for myself in this community. So what I'm searching for here is to make a change. My mission is to bring empowerment to the world. I want to empower all of you. I want to make sure there is equity and I want to be somebody that people can see and look up to and sh show them that they can succeed as well and to inspire future generations to lead. Because I'm not the only one, I want to see more of us. I want to see us change everything. We want to make sure that the deaf community not only goes through the programs, but also graduate and become successful people out in the world. I want to make sure that everybody is included, it's inclusive, and I would like to say thank you. I am very honored to receive this award today. And thank you for the opportunity. It has made a positive impact, not just on me, but others here as well. And so for future generations and past generations, I have been impacted in a positive way. I love you all and I am motivated to support and contributing to the deaf community. I'm committed to using my legacy and leadership skills to continue positively impacting other people's lives. I think that's one of the most important things we could do. And I wanted to say thank you, I love you all, and thank you for your unwavering support, and thank you for this award. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikel. I would like to now introduce Precious Padilla, who will introduce Janice Charles. Please come up. 
Yes, we can applaud. Both of you at the same time. Come on up. Thank you. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'm going to have to bring my, like... <laughs> Come on, there you go. Thank you, Dr. Eddie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm, it is a pleasure to introduce Janice Charles. Um, as I love to tell people all the time, there is no mistakes on Sac. I believe we come across the people that we're meant to come, ac to, meant to come across. Um, and in my own conversations with Janice every day that I'm lucky to have, um, Janice reminds me that I need to be a lifelong learner and be able to listen and stop and give myself the, <laughs> the five minutes, as she would say. Um, so I just want to give Janice the reassurance of when we were talking yesterday about what we both wanted to say up here today. Um, she had told me that um, what she leads with is you either walk in fear or you walk in love. And then today when I was coming to work, I was listening to Erica Badu, and didn't you know she said, um, love is life and life is love. And that's Janice. That's someone that comes every day, shows up for her family, her family that are here today, her son, her daughter, her auntie, her mother that's gonna greet her when she comes home today, and then also her lovely son that also um, wasn't here today, but will be able to hear from Janice when he, she gets home. Um, so with that being said, Janice Charles. <laughs> Hi, family. Um, first of all, before I get started, I'd just like to give thanks to God, because without God, I have no life. Um, with, um, I'm a 64-year-old mother, grandmother, student, peer mentor, sponsee. I have a lot of titles. Um, this award, when I think about inspiring, inspiring, I think about when I was hopeless. For a long time, I was hopeless. I, I went in, in a vicious cycle for 45 years. I always found consolence in sorrow and fear. You know, fear kept me stuck for 45 years. When I, I think the most inspiring thing to me was not when I had my children, but when I hurt my first grandson. And I said, God, you bless me with a second chance. But that still wasn't enough death and weight to hold me. I had to try it one more time my way. About four years ago, I became willing. I surrendered. I gave up. I had smoked up all my ideas, did time with all my ideas. I, I just, I didn't have no more ideas on how I could do this. So I was hopeless. So I surrendered and I became willing. I became willing to take a chance at life because before I was just surviving on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, who was, was, what was gonna be next? My daughter here used to always tell me, you're, so, you're such an educated dummy. And I was like, well, why would she say that? <laughs> and then she was like, you're so smart to just do some dumb things. She said, when you, and I look at my daughter and I get inspired by her confidence. Nothing will ever her. I used to say, how do you work with them people? She said, I don't have to sleep with them people. I ain't gonna ever see them people no more. <laughs> say, bye, I see you. You know, and I was like, wow, I wish I could be like that. So in the last three years, I've been trying to recreate my life. And I met some wonderful people on that path. Starting here at Mount Sac, Mr. Dr. Joe Lewis. When you say diversity, that's his group. <laughs> we're a bunch of people that didn't ever think we'd fit in. <laughs> but we're all there, and we're all inspired each and every day to help one another, to reach out to the man that might be still suffering are still struggling because there's no big eyes and there's no little U's. It's a us, it's a we, it's a Mount Sac community. Um, when I say inspire, when I first decided to come back to school, 
I was like, I cannot do this. I can't go back in there and compete with them young kids. I don't know nothing about computers. And my grandson called me dumb. He said, God, Gigi, why you got to be so dumb? I said, did you just call me dumb? He was like, no, I just meant if I could do it, you could do it. <laughs> I said, so that's a nice way of saying I'm dumb. Okay. So um, I had this fear of computers. Um, I've always been outspoken. I just was outspoken for the wrong cause. Now I'm outspoken for recovery. You can do this. Victims impacted by the criminal justice system. You know, we have a life. We've always been stigmatized. You say you've been in jail. People say, let me put my purse up. You say you get, I'm an addict. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Look at the medicine cabinet. You know, these are stigmas that we have to go through every day. And even being in recovery, there's still some people looking over your shoulder. But when what they see is a bright future. I know for me it is. When I came into Rising Scholars, first person I met was Carlos. I was like, you know, we had these preconceived notions about people. Like, what can he teach me? Shit, oh, he all tatted down, shit. We ain't on the yard no more. <laughs> we ain't on the yard no more, you know? So, but he taught me persistence and never give up. Rising Scholars is just like my second family. Mount Sac is my community. Um, Precious Padilla, my mentor, all the time, she be telling me, she, we sit down and we talk. And she said, why do, I like, why do these people gravitate to me? She said, because you, you, you're that light. You're that light in darkness. You know, I was chosen for so many different things here on this campus. When Joe Lewis, Dr. Joe Lewis honored me with being a peer mentor, I was like, oh, shoot. Now I really got to show him I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I really got to put some work in, you know. Um, Promise Plus, Miss Janetta. It's just like so many amazing programs right here on this campus that will give you that hope when you're hopeless. Um, I got a chance to go to Washington, D.C. to bring recovery to Mount Sac. And a lot of people, when you hear the word recovery, you say, um, I'm not an addict, but we recover from life. We recover from relationships. We, get, we recover from job loss. We, we recover from having been born with handicapped children. We learn. We recover from that. It's a lot of things that just all inclusive in recovery. So I got a chance to collaborate with three other people, and we brought a recovery club here to Mount Sac called We Rise. <laughs> so... Um, it's just been an honor and a pleasure. You know, I, I've been in, I'm go, I go to school, my major is drug and alcohol counseling, and that's, I want to give back what was so freely given to me. Because along that journey, I had inspiring women. I won't leave the men out, but when I seen that, this woman could do that, why can't I do it? If this woman can do that, why can't I do it? And I learned to peel back these layers. And after all, I'm not so dumb after all. <laughs> I learned that there's some smartness somewhere in here. I just have to keep digging to get it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's a hard job, and sometimes it's not. Because we as women, we're mothers. We're sisters. We're aunties. Some of us are grandmothers. Most of all, a lot of us are wives. And no matter what you are, gay, you know, lesbian, LGBTQ, maybe in recovery, you know, so you have, you're hearing impairing. This world, there's always a community, and that community is Mount San Antonio College. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. Now to introduce our next recipient, Inspiring Women, please welcome Tosh Bouet. It's nice to see so many friendly faces out here in the crowd. 
It makes being up here a little bit more easier. <laughs> um, I want to start with a little quote. And this quote um, is from my heart and is based on, um, it's based on Julie's inspiration. So um, most of you may see this at the end of my emails. And here it is. Um, Allow your path to be illuminated and extend the gesture. So that's something that I put together because um, Julie does inspire me. Um, okay, so greetings everyone. I am honored to be here to present an inspiring award to someone who is knowledgeable. Um, her direction and leadership has named her as one of this year's honorees. Julie has been an inspiring individual to many, which has led them towards a much brighter pathway. Her attention to detail and understanding has brought her, has been brought here, brought through, forgive me. <laughs> her attention to detail and understanding has been brought forth through her kindness. Today, she is now holding a title that here at Mount Sac, the women, um, women of Mount Sac, there's less than 90 fewer women here at Mount Sac. Um, sorry, I know I didn't say that correctly. Today, she holds a title held by fewer than 90 other Mount Sac women. So with that being said, I now want to turn your attention to the screen. Um, unfortunately, she is not here today. Um, but I would like to present Inspiring Women, Dr. Julie Marquez. Turn the volume up. Hello everyone, I am honored and humbled to be among this year's amazing women being recognized for advocating for equity, diversity, and inclusion. This award doesn't just reflect my personal journey, but also the collective efforts of EOPS Care, Next Up Reach, and CalWORKs staff, faculty, and students. It is because of their unwavering support that I have this platform today. Today, I embrace this opportunity to share my story to give you all a better understanding of where my passion for equity diversity and inclusion comes from. I was born in a small town in Mexico. My dad was forced to leave school at the age of 12 to work in El Campo. My mom was only afforded the opportunity to complete the ninth grade. Recognizing the limited opportunities in our hometown, my parents made the courageous decision to bring me to this country without papers when I was just two years old. They came to the United States in pursuit of the American dream. However, the reality of the United States proved to be far more challenging than they had anticipated. Growing up, I saw my father go to work day in and day out. He worked at a factory that paid him poorly and mistreated him because of his undocumented status. Yet despite how he was treated, he never missed a day of work. Growing up, I also saw my mom navigate the complexities of the medical system with very little knowledge of the English language. My youngest sister, Carolina, was diagnosed with cerebral palsy and many other conditions that I was too young to understand. Growing up, I witnessed my parents face financial challenges that forced them to rely on government assistance, such as food stamps and Section 8 housing to be able to survive. Growing up, I witnessed my parents doing what little they could to provide us with an opportunity to have a better future. To help me break the cycle of living in poverty, my parents enrolled me in a college access support program called Puente. I will forever be grateful to my Puente counselor who believed in me when I didn't. Growing up, I experienced many challenges that students from first generation, low income backgrounds face. Yet today I am here. So while many looking back on my background would say I came from nothing, that could not be 
farther from the truth. You see, I see my family history as a driving force behind all that I do. It is because I watched my parents, tios, tias, and abuelitos work hard every day to provide us with better opportunities that I value hard work. It is because I watched my mother advocate for my youngest sister, Carolina, that I value advocacy. It is because I watched my mother navigate a world that often failed to accommodate my sister's needs that I value equity and inclusion. It is because I watch my tias treat everyone with compassion that I value kindness. It is because I watch my parents get up after my sister passed away that I value resilience. It is because of the support program that I participated in that I value the transformational power of education. It is because of my life experiences that I can better understand the challenges faced by many students at Mount SAC. And finally, it is because of my background that I strive to continue to advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion alongside the EOPS CARE, Next Up Reach, and CalWORKs team at Mount SAC. So thank you once again for the opportunity to share my story and congratulations to Nikhil, Lori, and Janice. You all are amazing. That was amazing that we had her remote in from Japan. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce Augustine Urikumbura, who will present the um, Inspiring Women Award to Dr. Lori Walker. Hi everyone, my name is Augustine. I use Danny pronouns. Um, I am a proud Cutie by Pop student. I have the immense pleasure of nominating Dr. Lori Walker for this wonderful award alongside other inspiring women such as Nikel and the other two staff who were involved. And I am just so immensely grateful to have such a wonderful and caring human being, a professor who has taught me so much about humanities and the humanistic inquiry, especially coming from a social sciences background myself. I had the great pleasure of choosing Lori's class specifically because I did not really find what I needed in the English 1C class. Um, this class often does literary analysis of works perhaps by old dead white men, which was not great. And um, as a very feminist person, I actually really loved it when like Lori would email me those like little like smiley face emoticons, like the little colon and like, you know, that parenthesis thing. And then there were like not one, but five um, blushy emojis in that same syllabus, which was wonderful. So that was the deal. Um, and so basically when I had introduced myself to Lori, like it really was just like these like short questions. Um, she had replied like a week later saying like, oh, I'm so sorry if it is like terribly late email and that was like its own thing. But I do wanna say when I think of feminism, I often think of feminism as not specifically or exclusively for the female bodied, but rather anybody who sort of exemplifies womanhood, signs of femininity, um, like a signal and a celebration of like what makes us human and just like that avenue of expression, it really is not binary. And because of Lori, I had been able to discuss asexuality studies more in detail. I'm now the chair of the National Women's Studies Association Asexuality Studies Caucus, which is an interest group specifically for those interested in asexual scholarship, often with those of the lived positionality as ace people or perhaps aromantic. I encompass many of these identities. I'm just like a hodgepodge of holistic wellness, as in I am a romantic spectrum, asexual, um, I'm a person of color, my parents are Sri Lankan, low income, disabled, neurodivergent, everything. <laughs> and so it really is an immense honor to think of this person who has like cherished my like value as a student so much, who has told me to persist and like go beyond these like limitations and bounds especially of disciplinary bounds, right? So very much, I'm very thankful to have this person. Like I'm choked up already, not on just my dry spit, but also, <laughs> I mean like thinking of this person who has helped me articulate these beliefs and like this meaningfulness of like what it means to be a professor. I mean like the intimacies and intricacies of identity, becoming my own person. I mean like, you know, really thinking about like this journey that we undertake, um, not only in terms of mentorship, right, 
as in the connection and kinship. I myself am gender, gender queer, and I guess you could say I have both masculine and feminine energy, but really thinking about like, how do we define gender? How do we redefine like what it means to us? Who holds value to us? And how we celebrate these people who are immensely valuable in our lives. And Lori is very much not only initiating this history of like femtorship as a discipline, philosophy of life, and like celebrating like things like neuroplasticity, um, like the brain's flexibility and ability to adapt to like adverse circumstances, extreme circumstances of oftentimes trauma and disability. I think I had mentioned in my um, in my recommendation that Lori is non-disabled, but she actually does have diabetes. It's just that like we encompass very different elements of disability, and so I would very much like to acknowledge and cherish our wonderful, wonderful, lovely person, Lori Walker. Thank you. Thank you. You're so deserving. I'm so happy for you. Thank you so much, Augustine, for both your, nom your nomination and your very kind words. <laughs> I very much appreciate that. I also want to appreciate and thank the committee because I know that there are many other uh, inspiring women on this, on this campus that could have been selected as well. When I first uh, found out that I had been honored with this award, the best way that I, could I can explain that moment to you is that I felt seen. And I'm, I'm happy to see that mm, I wasn't sure if people would understand what I said that. Because in some ways that can sound simplistic. But to me, that's incredibly important that opportunity to be genuinely seen for who you believe you genuinely are, <clears throat> I think that's an amazing gift. And quite frankly, I didn't always feel that way. Um, I, I grew up with a brother. I don't, I rarely, I don't think I've ever shared about my brother. Um, but I grew up with an older brother um, who today would be diagnosed as a type one, um, bipolar disorder with, um, um, what would you call that? Well, sort of psychotic features, yes. Yeah, you could say that, yes, you could say that. Yes, yes. Um, and keep in mind, he was older than I am. So in the time that this was occurring, there, you know, mental health was not where it is today. Um, when my, my parents knew at a very young age that my brother was different. No one else in my family uh, exhibited behaviors like my brother. And they brought him to phys physicians, they brought him to counselors, there was no um, medication offered, there was no support offered to my parents. And so they really didn't know what to do. The neighbors in the area just simply felt that my parents were poor disciplinarians, and they were very vocal about this, by the way. None of my friends were allowed to come over to my house when I was young. I wasn't allowed to go to some of my friends' houses when they, I was young. I, I'm not sure why that was. Um, but a lot of the time, I simply felt very um, separate from the community in which I lived. And I learned very, at a very young age that people make a lot of assumptions about others. And that actually stops many of us from genuinely being seen. As a result of that, and I mean starting at a very young age, I, I developed some basic principles about my life. Number one, to never make any assumptions about the intentions of other people's thoughts, feelings, or actions. And number two, always, Always be compassionate. And number three, every one of us wants to be genuinely loved and seen for who we truly are. And in order to do that for someone, it means genuinely looking past the external and investing in that person so that they feel genuinely heard and understood. Um, I have committed my life, quite literally, to these, these principles. They're, they're very near and dear to me because of the experiences I had growing up. And of course, that means practicing these within our Mount Sac community as well. Um, some of you know this about me. 
Um, but many years ago, early actually in my career here, I um, unofficially adopted two of my students and I have now officially adopted one of those students as my adult daughter, Sophie. She called herself Gabriella when she was here. Um, early on, she came to me in her uh, broken English and said, will you be woman in my life? And I thought, I don't think she wants me to be her romantic partner. I think she's asking me to be her mentor. And so of course I said yes. After that, she shared with me that her father passed away when she was 13 and her mother uh, abandoned she and her siblings uh, just a several days after that. They didn't have any extended family um, and this was happening in Mexico at the time. When I say that they were abandoned, to be clear, they lived in fields. They lived on streets. They went for days at a time without food. And so according to society, they were invisible. And that really struck me because that is the absolute extreme of not being seen. I also knew that all they needed was to be seen and to be supported and they could do such amazing things. Now, I wanna be clear, I was not the only person to see she and her brother. Her brother went to school here as well. Uh, you know, as the saying goes, it takes a village. And with support, Sophie was able to complete her, actually her brother as well, by the way, they both completed their, um, their AAs, their bachelors and their masters, both of them, by the way. And Sophie is now employed as a social worker. Yeah, yay. <laughs> Now, I tell that story partly just because I love this story. Yay, Sophie. <laughs> but I also tell that story because I love that moment when someone feels genuinely seen because at that moment, their hope becomes action. I've met so many students who they come to me with this general sense of wanting something better for themselves. And at the same time, there is something in the history of their lives that is stopping them from achieving that. When, they're fe when they feel seen, when they feel seen and accepted for who they genuinely are, it is amazing how that hope starts becoming action. When suddenly they start pushing those boundaries away, they start dismantling these barriers that have kept them back. And then suddenly those actions become achieving these goals that moves them per, you know, further toward their future. I find that amazing. And I'm so thankful to be in a community where I can experience that with them. So to my colleagues, for all of you that feel that it's your mission to empower and motivate and help your students to succeed and move toward a better future, I see you and I get it because I'm here too. <laughs> and for all of you who make the commitment and choose not to make assumptions, to always be compassionate and to genuinely invest in other people, I see you and I thank you for being a constant support of inspiration for others. Thank you. I'm very inspired, and we have one more inspirational closing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Melba Castro. Overall, I am filled with gratitude for the opportunity to be in this space and the space of love and what I've heard throughout this luncheon is how much love there is. Um, gratitude in terms of all of the amazing women who are here today. 
It is a privilege to be in this gathering to celebrate and honor the women who advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Today, we have been reminded of the power of resilience, unity, and the beauty of embracing our differences and collective strength as women. I would like this to take this opportunity to share part of a poem that many of you probably know very well. Um, some of you, this might be new, um, but Maya Angelou's Phenomenal Women. And so when I was asked to um, provide a closing, that's the first thing that popped into my head in terms of uh, not only the poem itself, but also someone who is inspirational in using the power of the pen to inspire countless women and individuals on an ongoing basis. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I am not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. But when I start to tell them they think I am telling lies, I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the curl of my lips, I am woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that is me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please, and to a man, the fellows stand and fall on their knees. And they swarm around me, a hive of honeybees. I say, it's the fire in my eyes, the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist, the joy in my feet, I am woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that is me. Now you understand why my head is not bowed. I do not shout or jump about or have to talk real loud when you see me passing. I ought to make you proud, I say. It's the click in my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand the need for my care, because I am woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman, that is me. So to all the women here, you are truly, truly phenomenal. I am inspired by our everyday sheroes, our students who are phenomenal and phenomenal women um, who are here that also inspire our students and also our community. Um, Mount San Antonio College is enriched by the contributions of countless inspiring women who have dedicated themselves to championing diversity, equity, and inclusion. As we leave this luncheon, let us carry with us the stories and experiences shared today. Let us carry the spirit of this gathering, inspired and empowered. Thank you for joining in this phenomenal celebration, honoring phenomenal women, and also a huge appreciation to Associated Students for creating this space in which we come together and are reminded of the phenomenal women of Mount Sac who are here each and every day. So thank you. And with that, I also have another phenomenal woman with me. Um, and I would like to ask the um, student life team to please join me up here. Yes, it is. So we um, have the honor of celebrating somebody also here today. Thank you, Dr. Castro. Um, the student life team would now like to take a moment to recognize one of our very own inspiring women, Dr. Andy Farron Sims. <laughs> it is my honor on behalf of the student life team to congratulate you on your promotion to Associated Dean, Associate Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences. Your contributions to student life and student services will leave a lasting legacy that will impact students for years to come. Please accept this bouquet as a token of our appreciation. We will miss you tremendously. You will always be a part of the Student Life family. Thank you.
Oh, okay. I was supposed to come up here and just say thank you for coming today, for all the inspiring women. Uh, my favorite, favorite poem, Dr. Castro, so thank you for that. I, I just think um, to all of the femtors in the room, to all the men who have the courage to stand beside us, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for coming. I'm also so very honored to see my humanities family join me today as well. So in celebrating one of our phenomenal faculty, but also all of you. So I will say thank you. This is not goodbye. This is see you at another event, in another capacity, in another opportunity to help me inspire you. So thank you, everyone, for coming today. Happy plug. If you would like the bouquet centerpiece on your table, fight amongst yourselves. Yes. I'll put the music back on. It's going. Yeah, it's, it's, it's 